Hey, all you rad dads out there. Welcome to the Rad Dad Show. For the listeners and, and viewers out there, who are you? Well, my name is Greg Norton. I live in Red Wing, Minnesota. And uh, a lot of you probably most likely know me from uh, uh, as the bassist for Husker Du. Uh, and uh, as over the years since then, I had a long career as a chef in restaurants. I uh, sold wine for about 15 years. I um, got back into music um, after a 14-year uh, hiatus from even picking up a bass. Uh, about actually, I was probably about 15, 15 years ago, uh, maybe a little bit longer. And uh, since then, I've, I've uh, been in several bands, I've recorded a few different albums, and now I'm in a new band that I'm like super excited about, and I feel is one of the best projects I've ever been involved in, and one that brings me an amount of joy that is reminiscent of the early days of, of Husker, and uh, that band is called Ultra Bomb. Uh, We've got a record um, that's digitally has been out for a while. The actual vinyl record should be out very soon. And uh, we're about to hit the road in the in the U.S. Awesome. Stoked. And you're a dad. That's why you're here. And I'm a dad. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have two beautiful daughters, uh, Coco and Stella. Um, I became a dad at 55. So... Mm -hmm. I'm a late bloomer. What, what can I say? And um, Coco and Stella are uh, 15 months apart. They're awesome kids, um, both totally unique individuals, uh, both very creative. And as a dad, I'm just trying not to do anything to to stomp their spirit or or uh, you know I'm always encouraging their creativity and in, in whatever they want to do nice uh i i i'm a, a father of two uh one who is uh, 11 years old and one that's six months old and i'm 45 so i felt you know that 45 age was even kind of pushing the age thing how does it uh you know being 55 and being a, a new dad how has that been like is, is did you have any fears were you worried nervous uh <laughs> So I never thought I would have kids. Uh, it, it just never seemed right. And then um, uh, I met Toby um, and uh, Toby has a, has a daughter who was four when, when, when we first got together and um, she's an incredible mom. Uh, her daughter, daughter Ava has turned out to be like a really bright, smart kid um and it it you know that it it felt right so and then once coco was born i couldn't imagine not having kids you know you know the feeling it's it's all of a sudden you you've got that little baby in your arms and and you're like well this is this is just how it's supposed to be this is this is everything is right with the world now that's that's kind of a universal that I've had. You know, I've done a number of these interviews, and it's that you know that that moment you kind of hold it, hold your your baby for the first time. Need to kind of describe that feeling a little bit more. I uh, just an overwhelming sense of awe <laughs> that that I could even possibly be a part of of creation. You know. And then, uh, and then just watching them grow up and watching their personalities develop, and and uh, you know, every it just I mean, it just brings so much joy uh, to to watch. Um, I'm lucky. I think my kids are lucky. I, I realize that there are kids in this world that are far less fortunate for for their environments or or. Um, you know how how they you know the struggle to to meet basic necessities and stuff like that um 
really something I would like to see in the world improve it. And, and I'm hoping that my daughters also, uh, you know, will feel the same way, you know, we're, we're, um, want them to, to be empathetic and we want them to, you know, be considerate and, and kind and, and they are. Well, because of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and their mother, Toby. As well. <laughs> there we go. Of course. Do you consider yourself a rad dad? Yeah, I guess so. I think I'm a rad dad. That's that, that's like, yeah, I'm a cool mom. I'm a rad dad. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Like some people, you know, you, you kind of you're joking or laughing about it, but but some are uh, some some of my guests have been kind of a bit hesitant to a ask answer that question. That they kind of other go from like one like, oh, you better ask my kids, or I don't know, or yeah, or, like I like the idea that you would you know you embrace that and be like, fuck yeah, I'm rad, man. Right. Yeah. No, I, I say embrace it. Uh, you know, I, I, I want my kids to to uh, be able to fly their freak flag, you know, uh, and, and not be worried about what other people are going to think uh, for. You know, the same thing, trying to, you know, to to get them not to judge other people, but not to themselves worry that other people are judging them even though that that's going to happen inevitably but how they deal with that and 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 roll with it you know um i mean it, it's not like i sit down and, and go all right kids today's lesson is how not <laughs> to you know how, how to uh today's lessons topic is zero fucks you have zero fucks to give and it doesn't matter what somebody says about the way you um put together your outfit or the way you, you know, drew that picture or whatever. It's like, you be you. And, and do you think that sort of idea of like you be you and flying what you call your, your freak flag, is that something that's just inherent in like punk rock or is that inherent in parenting and, and the support that we give our kids? Uh, I would like to think it was both. Did, did punk and, and being a musician and influence your parenting, do you think? Uh, just in the, I guess the aspect of, of you know, encouraging their, their individualism, encouraging their, their um, them to, you know, do things on their own, encouraging individual, I already said individualism, uh, you know, and creativity. I, I think, yeah, that, that probably comes out of the, the punk ethos. So, okay, so you've talked about like, you know, encouraging creativity, the freak flag, individualism, that stuff. What are some other traits that make make one a rad dad? Besides just kind of obviously, you know, supporting our kids. Is there anything that kind of sticks out? You know, you said you proclaimed proudly that, yeah, you're a rad dad. What are some traits that make you that way? Uh, well, I'm also still very much individually who I am, you know, and and I'm not. Um, you know, I guess a lot of times, uh, people, when they become parents, all of a sudden their personality changes, uh, and they, they get very conservative in what they do and, and, and who they are and, and out of, out of probably thinking like, well, this is what I need to do to, you know, raise my kids. Uh, and that's, that's sure. That's, that's a legit uh way to parent um but that's not who i am um you know like i said it's it's i've got these these wonderful individuals that that um um came into my life and and i gave them life and 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 um you know like i said i i, I want to see that spark continue i want to see it to grow i want them to be able to always you know have passion about chasing their dream and and in a way it's like you know ultra bomb is 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 me still chasing my dream and not giving up on that you know what and what's uh we'll, we'll intersperse with some of that old, the 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 band stuff so what like why the new band like why now like what what uh you know took this this hiatus and then you you, you know hooked up with you two guys and that now you're back at her yeah so when i started 
playing bass, I uh, again uh, picked it up again. Actually, I was um, working it with with uh, a band called Gang Font, which is, is some of the the top uh, jazz avant garde uh, minds on the planet. Dave King from the Bad Plus, uh, Craig Tabor on keyboards, Eric. Eric Frotsky, uh, who was also plays in a band with Dave called Happy Apple on guitar. And it was really, you know, op opening up the floodgates of for creativity. Uh, due to the fact that they were full time world renowned touring musicians, Gang Font didn't play a lot of shows. You know, we managed to play about one a year. And uh, and we haven't played for a few years, but, uh, you know, the band is still very much a band. Um, we recorded a second record with a uh, uh, keyboardist who replaced Craig Tabor and uh, Brian Nichols took his spot. That record we recorded in 2010 and uh, I'm getting together later tonight with Dave King and we're going to try to get that sucker finally released. Oh, nice. um, <laughs> yeah. 13 years uh, later. Uh, I've always used the, uh, the uh, a wine analogy here that what we recorded was was ultimately it was a grand reserva that just needed to be cellared for an appropriate amount of time before it was ready to be released. And so it, anyways, skipping forward from Gang Font, um, I got involved with with a band called Porcupine. Uh, and they they were more of a of a rock uh, alternative rock uh, indie band type type vibe, and I really liked uh, playing with those guys. Uh, we were three piece: Casey, the rock on guitar, Ian Prince, who was an incredible drummer, uh, and myself. And uh, you know, we we worked we we managed to uh, record. Um, a record and get that out and we did some touring and you know we we went out on the road and did a support uh slot uh for the flesh eaters um on their last uh last get together so hanging out with john doe and 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 um uh dj bone bone break and um steve berlin and it it was it was uh, and and Chris uh, Desjardins, it was that was a really really fun tour. We went out of the road with Flipper, with David Yao uh, on vocals. That was incredible. We opened up for Mud Honey on Arana shows. We did some stuff with Built to Spill. It was really a lot of fun, but we were kind of stuck in that support slot, and it wasn't really wasn't really kind of going anywhere. It 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 we weren't making enough money where I could like really kind of say like, I need to, you know, devote more time to this. And uh, ultimately through frustrations, um, you know, we, we decided this just wasn't working out. Casey decided to change the direction and the lineup of the band. So um, Ian and I were, were departed. Casey's got a whole new lineup, uh, you know, which is good for him. But right when that happened, Finney McConnell, uh, who was a Facebook friend and, and a fan of Husker, just kind of messaged out of the blue and was like, hey, I got this idea. You should be in, in a, we should start a band. And then he's like, I know the, the greatest punk rock drummer on the planet, Jamie Oliver. We're, we're, we're good mates. And, um, and I guess at the same time, he it messaged Jamie and said like, Hey, we should start a band. And, and uh, you know, Greg Norton can be our bass player. And so really he, he didn't really ask either of us first. He asked us both at the same time. And we both said, yeah, sounds great. So that was, uh, you know, coming up on a, on a couple of years ago, that September Finney was in Berlin on a um, solo tour, had some studio time booked. Jamie happened to be in Berlin uh drumming with with a, uh, a a german band and i just got this crazy idea like i should go to berlin <laughs> that's awesome and so i i uh, booked a flight flew to berlin i was there for for um 
you know, basically flew in on a uh, Wednesday night. We hit the studio Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and flew out first thing Monday morning. Wow. Uh, first time I'd ever met Jamie, like in person. We had we had, had uh, a couple of video um, chats on on Messenger. When Finney showed up at the studio Thursday morning, it was the first time I had met him. And uh, that day we, you know, Finney had like, he's like, lads, I've written all these great riffs. And so we started going through uh, music and, and he'd play a riff and, and we'd be like, yeah, okay. And we'd like hammer out an arrangement. We'd get comfortable with it. And we'd have the engineer like record it uh, pretty much one or two takes after we were like, you know, got it to a point where we liked the arrangement uh four songs the first day six songs the second day the third day jamie was out uh on the road with with um playing drums and on that that third day you know we're just kind of adding some um uh, some additional like rhythm tracks and and i showed finney all of my lyrics and he's like oh, i've got the whole record figured out and on uh Sunday, the, the last day, Jamie's back. Then he goes in, he sings the entire record uh, to lyrics that he just saw the day before. And uh, we did, you know, some on the on the fly editing while while he was in the recording booth to so that things would flow right. And at the end of the end of the day, we had 10 songs, 10 incredible songs written. And we had enough time to uh, uh, we decided to record Sonic Reducer by um you know the, the the dead boys song but originally recorded by uh rocket from the tombs from cleveland uh back in in um you know the mid 70s um i don't think a lot of people realize that david thomas from Perubu was uh, you know was one of the original writers of that song so oh, wow. uh we got that done things are really clipping along we uh, everybody goes home we try to quick get uh some shows in 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 Canada li lined up, and then that we hit a stumbling block there, where where Jamie books a ticket, gets to the airport, and then they are like, "Oh, well, where's your visa?" And he's like, "They told me I didn't need one," and they're like, "Oh, no, we decided that you do need one, so you can't go to Canada." So that gets scrapped, and then, uh, so then we're we're like, you know, still trying to get the record mixed. Uh, Finney finishes. Uh, all of the guitar overdubs and vocal overdubs in, in Toronto sends everything off to Jamie in London. He gets it mixed and mastered. Uh, and this is now about a year ago. And um, at this point now we're like, okay, well, let's get, let's get a, uh, you know, a, a, a England, Ireland tour going. And then that gets screwed up because of COVID uh, again, another COVID misstep. And uh, we had, again, postponed that tour, and we were going to go over uh, at the end of, of June, uh, but that's when I got diagnosed with prostate cancer. So that scrapped that. Uh, we did manage to play one show in Minneapolis at a, uh, for a uh, summer festival, uh, which, and that went great it was fantastic uh, really so much fun playing live with these guys and um you know in in the interim from getting the record finished and and we're putting you know putting it out ourselves taking pre-orders and then all of these delays that are just right now seem to be just normal operating procedure for the industry the record is about to come out i know we've got a lot of frustrated fans out there but you know we're it's it's crazy how long it takes to get something back from a from a pressing plant so the record's finally coming out we've got a tour booked and um uh 18 shows in 21 days Nice. starting may 11th and ending on may 31st so i guess that's 20 days and i'm just really super excited about it <laughs> sounds what what a, what a journey there definitely uh I, my friend has a, a record company presses uh, records and um we not him 
personally, but he has the company puts out records and yeah, the pressing plant issues are definitely something that's been kind of plaguing bands. You know, it's, yeah. you know, I, have, I have a lot of friends that play in, in, in bands too, and they're just looking at, you know, two years kind of down the road before they could even get a physical copy in the hands. It's nuts. I don't know if it's still like that, but. Um, it's still really bad. <laughs> uh, what What is happening though, is that there are all of these new plants coming online. There's uh, one locally here in Minnesota that's about to open up. Uh, I, evidently Metallica is opening up their own record pressing plant just to press their own records, which it's like, okay, that's great. What are you going to do with the plant when you're not putting out a Metallica record? But, uh, but I think it's going to be one of those things where the pendulum is going to swing completely the other way and you're going to have a glut of record pressing plants, which probably is good for artists because you, uh, You'll probably be able to get something pressed and at a at a reasonable uh, price, and get it out and in the market like relatively quickly. You know. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, it's pretty nuts too. I was just reading about that Metallica buy their own pressing plant <laughs> uh, to to have the money to do that. I guess eh? it's pretty nuts to me. Right. <laughs> well, you know, and that's you know there there've been a couple um, Adele's record. Uh, pushed everybody back because every pressing plant switched over to it to press her record. Uh, you know, Beyonce's record did the same thing. So, you know, it's one of those things where you've got like these mega, you know, and, and Taylor Swift as well. I mean, she's put out what three records in the last two years. So every time one of these mega artists like schedules production for one of their records, everybody puts everybody else on hold and it just, you know, exacerbates the situation. Yeah, it's nuts to, to have that much power, hey? <laughs> right. I love the I love the Canadian connection you have uh, with your band because because Finney's from like the band Mahomes, right? It was a Canadian kind of Celtic type rock yep, band. That's, that's correct. Yep. And Jamie, yep. I mean, Jamie actually drummed for my favorite band, uh, at least one of my favorite bands of uh, all time, local Edmonton legends SNFU. And so he, he did a stint for there. So I, I love that uh, that connection there. That oh, Canadian, for sure, yeah. Canadian flavor. Mm -hmm. um, let's uh, let's you know how do you how do you um, balance? You know, you talk about like going to Berlin and like now you're going on tour. How do you balance kind of being yourself and being a dad? You know, especially in the industry that you're in, kind of going away and coming home, that sort of thing. How does how does that work for you? Well, you know, it it's it's tough. Uh, it's one of those things, you know, being, being a dad is a full-time job. Uh, and then of course, then you need your full-time job so that you can provide for your family and then being a musician and in a working band. And in order to make it work, that also has to be a full-time job. So you've got three full-time jobs. Uh, ultimately, uh, I want, you know, the musician part to be the full-time job that is the provider because that actually then will give me more time to spend with my kids. You know, it's, we'll be out on the road for three weeks, but then we'll be home for three months before we go out again. So, uh, you know, if you go out every three months and you're gone for three weeks, but you know that you're home and, uh, that that's the goal you yeah. know uh right now the uh, uh i've been working in a flour mill um that you know that that mills wheat and turns it into flour and mm -hmm. it's it's um uh 12 hour shifts uh they're they're long days it's actually you even though it, it it's a good paycheck at the end of the day it's there is there isn't any real work-life balance because you are at your job so much and when you are home it's only you know you're only seeing your kids for for you know a little bit of time uh you know and and that's that's a struggle for for parents everywhere right you know um to to make ends meet but that's why i want 
the musician thing to work out. So I, you know, I I'm home from the road. I can just hang out with my kids. Yeah. And just be present. I, I get that struggle. My brother, you know, he works a lot, a lot out of town. And so he's gone you know, at times. And even when he is in town working, it's, you know, long hours, you know, especially in, in Alberta, we have that, the oil and gas industry. And so there's right. a lot of people yep. that I am aware of, and, you know, they work, like you said, 12, 14 hour days and, you know, seeing their kids maybe an hour before bedtime and then they're back off kind of, you know, yeah, I, I'm fortunate. I'm a school teacher, so I get uh, plenty of time to kind of <laughs> spend with my kids because, you know, generally we have the same breaks, you know, summer off and, and whatnot. And so totally understand nice, that, yeah. that work, mm -hmm. work, uh, work home kind of balance there. Uh, in what ways has fatherhood changed you? Hmm. Um, or did it? You know, con <laughs> constantly, or not constantly, but but just like I said, trying not to uh, do anything that that will, you know, crush their spirit. You know, try so trying to be better about you know. Um, Thinking, trying not to be as reactive to things, uh, so that they are, you know, better, and being able to explain to to them like what what's going on and, and things like that, so that they they just don't see the like um, a sharp reaction uh, to anything really, you know, in, in the world or in personal life, and uh, just trying to be more conscious, uh, more conscientious. Um, I don't know. That's about it. There you go. That's good. How about any fears? Did you have anyone becoming a dad? Find when you found out, or <laughs> uh, yeah, not uh, not screwing it up. So, <laughs> uh, you know, and also probably uh, not being, you know, not turning into to my parents you know my uh my my dad was was a traveling salesman he wasn't home a whole lot and when he was home my parents fought a lot and um you know I just didn't want you know I certainly didn't don't want that for my kids and 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 um you know so so like I said trying to to be there for him and be present and yeah, the, the being That's present, to, pre, yeah, <laughs> being, being yeah. present is important. I, I'm kind of with you there as well. It's like everything. I feel a lot of my uh, decisions that I've made in my life are the complete opposite of what my my parents decided or and or did. <laughs> so is that. But then I, you know, I've had a lot of guests who were like really in line with their parents, and they, so it's just an interesting kind of dynamic, you know, parents and and kids, and then all that sort of stuff. Can, would you be comfortable, you know? Uh, talking a little bit about the relationship with your dad. Uh, well, my parents split up when I was fourteen, so um, you know it, it's one of those things where where later on in life, um, at, at a certain point, I would have liked to have been able to sit down and address things with him uh, from from my childhood, but it was one of those things where now it's like so much time has passed that I don't think that that would have been really fruitful or possible. Um, my dad actually passed away the, um, uh, right after we found out that, that Coco was, was, was on her way. So, um, I was able to tell him that he was going to be a, a granddad and when he was very happy about that, but he, he actually had had a, a stroke and then a heart attack um kind of back to back and so he he never got to meet my my kids but um you know i, I don't know I, I i don't think my childhood was probably real different from a lot of my my peers and my friends you know it's yeah you know, interesting thing about punk rock was uh back in the day if you had a dysfunctional family you wore it like a badge <laughs> you know hey i'm fucked up too how about you you know <laughs> yeah 
uh, yeah, sorry to hear about your dad. I, I, yeah, I, I, you know, uh, I always ask that. I'm just kind of curious. I, I would how, how oh, some of these questions that I kind of came up with were were things that I always think about too. And you know, if people were to ask me how I would describe my relation, my dad committed suicide about 20, 20 some years ago. I'm always kind of kind of curious as as to what that would have been, or you know, always curious as what that relationship and how that affects your parenting you know and you kind of mentioned a little bit kind of wanting to do something kind of different did 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 aside from that is there anything that maybe you learned from your parents that you use today on your your kids or kind of passed down is there any traditions anything lessons that you learned or was there this kind of dichotomous split <laughs> uh you know, my mom actually always encouraged my creativity and, and individualism. So um, I'm grateful for that. Um, although she doesn't necessarily understand the whole thing about being in a band and would always ask me when, when I was going to get a real job. <laughs> uh, when we signed with Warner Brothers, uh, the, uh, uh, the attorney that we were working with to work out the contract with Warner's after we signed, he told my mom that I was now gainfully employed. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, and she was super supportive of, of the band. She went to um, almost every local Husker Du show. Uh, she was there and like, like all the shows at first Avenue, she, she and Grant Hart's mom would hang out together and they had t-shirts that, uh, that said Husker mom on it, you know? Nice. <laughs> I love hearing that. My a lot of my friends, like I said, you know, uh, are in bands and and um, and I play in a like a bad religion cover band you know, as kind of a fun thing that we do as part of this dad rad dads thing, and he plays in it. And his parents come to a lot of our shows and oh, cool, super awesome. supportive and just like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sit in the back, you know, have a have a water and a pop and and listen to to punk rock and. Some, a lot of my friends play in some pretty heavy hardcore bands too. So like the music isn't, you know, soft lift, listening by any means, but they're always there and supportive. Right. And so that's cool to, to hear your, your mom being supportive in that sense. A few more questions here is um, you know, what are the most rewarding aspects of being a dad? Uh, I would say the most rewarding aspect of, of being a dad is experiencing the joy that that uh, my kids bring into my life and and just watch them as they continue to, to grow and and uh, uh, you know it's crazy it's like when when I was a kid it's like oh well you know don't don't sit in front of the TV too long you know uh, get out and play and all this and you know, obviously we still encourage our kids to get out and play but the stuff that they learn from watching uh, YouTube videos is it blows me away. It's like <laughs> uh, the 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 other the other day, uh, you know, Coke uh, sitting here talking to Coco, and and she's like, "Yeah, you know, a lot of people uh, spend too much time uh, worrying about what it needs to be happy, but when if they would just realize that." Uh, the things that they have are the things that can make them happy. They'd be a lot happier. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that's, that's like one of the main tenets of stoicism. It's like, are, are you Marcus Aurelius? It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it blew me that, away. That insight. Uh, for sure. mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and uh, the, the, they both just amaze me every single day. You know, it, it's just, I, I, I just love, being amazed by him ah, I love that too I like, I like like hearing that and uh it's funny that you say like the YouTube kind of idea it was just yesterday my, my son after after school just kind of sitting around and uh usually when he comes home from school he walks home from school he's in grade six and and uh you know I came home from work roughly at the same time and I'm doing my stuff whatever getting ready for for, for supper and he usually goes on his iPad for right after school and and I don't know, I was just maybe in a cantankerous mood. It's like, oh, get off your iPad. Like, why don't you go outside and run around? <laughs> I was like, wait right. a minute. I'm just sounding exactly like my parents did when I would watch TV or play you know, Nintendo exactly, back in yeah. the day. It's pretty funny. 
Uh, but yeah, yeah. it's definitely you know, definitely another really another thing that they do, which also kind of like really kind of blows me away is they're they're both really into Roblox, uh, and and their world building. You know, it's and uh, the way that they can so easily navigate around in in those these virtual environments also really blows me away. And, and I mean, as they grow up, that's only going to become a bigger part of reality and, and how people interact with with their world and uh you know i'm not and i'm okay with that you know i'm not going to stop their development just because i don't necessarily know how to do it you know yeah it's it yeah my son was uh really into that for a while he's got, moved on to nhl 23 and it's it's like I was watching. A, so is, like, isn't that a prerequisite in Canada? That, you know, <laughs> yeah, to... yeah, I think so. Like I can't even navigate that three dimension. I'm like, I can't. I did. It's like digital Lego, right? But in a three D oh, world, exactly, it's yep. super, super interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and even with like the NHL 23 video game, he he, you have the ability to be a manager of a team, and you actually build the team. So he plays. Oh, cool. He spends less time actually playing the hockey game than he does building the team and and looking at things and, and talking about what was he talking about like uh, salary caps and stuff like that i was like ha huh, that's super interesting in the fact that he's thinking about those things and has to kind of maintain a level yeah. of, of of skill right. but also keep it under a certain, right. certain yeah thing, that, so. that that is interesting i mean he's learning things that you wouldn't think that he would learn from a video game yeah exactly yeah and I'm okay with it. You know, uh, being a, a teacher for 20 plus years, I've kind of, I started teaching pre uh, text messaging and, and I've seen kind of this whole evolution of, you know, social media and whatnot influence uh, students and kids. And, and uh, so I'm okay with it. I try to embrace it and kind of maybe keeps me young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that along well, with my, punk my kids music. definitely keep me young. Yeah. The, yeah. My, mine too. Uh, mm -hmm. So okay, let's let's talk a little bit more about the record. Let's kind of wrap it up here. An opportunity to kind of brag a little bit about you've already talked about your experience, how you came together with Finney and and Jamie, and, and your record experience. So just maybe recap. You know what, what's kind of what you got coming up in terms of the tour and. Uh, well, that's that's the the tour, the ultimate release of the vinyl. Um, you know, so the tour starts May 11th in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, like I said, we have 18 shows uh, culminating in, in a uh, two two shows at Punk Rock Bowling in, in Las Vegas. So we'll do a um, support slot to the Dickies in a, in a private uh, kind of a showcase club show that's already sold out. And on the last day, we are on the main stage downtown. Um, kind of late afternoon, uh, but Suicidal Tendencies and the Dropkick Murphys are the headliners for, for that day. So that'll be really cool. Um, get get out on a big stage, play in front of a, a, a big crowd. Uh, while uh, while we're here in, in, in touring, we'll, we'll start working on new material for the next record. And... Um, Finney's got a bunch of new riffs. I've got um, new lyrics. And uh, the goal is to get something recorded, um, probably not this summer, but but this fall. And um, uh, we're looking at doing uh, dates in Europe and England, Scotland, and Ireland in, um, in the fall. So October, early November, some, sometime in there. And... Uh, uh, the goal is, next year is is to have this be our you know the full time gig, uh, probably do um, you know get a Canadian tour in get um, uh, you know East Coast West Coast, uh, get back to Europe and just play and have fun and and um, hopefully bring joy to uh, our fans and and our listeners and and. Um, Keep chasing that dream. There you go, man. That's awesome. Let's uh, last one here. Any words of wisdom for any of the new dads or the rad dads listening? Uh, 
embrace every moment, <laughs> right? Um, every every stage that they go through will will blow you away with something new. Uh, embrace every moment and and don't regret as things change. Just change with it and keep embracing it. Awesome. Let's end it there, Dave. Thank you.